afternoon, evening. I want to thank um, Luciana and uh, Lucia for um, inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to actually reach Brazil, uh, reach Latin America for the first time, and to be invited to talk about a subject, a number of subjects that are very close to my heart. I sort of feel we should have a moment's silence for our friends in North America, but maybe we've had enough waiting around. Let's leave them to stew in their own juice for a while, before we stew in their juice. Um, so what I'm going to try and do um, is um, lay out a kind of panorama, and I will be talking about panoramas a bit, of, um, as it says in the title, visual spectacle before and after animated photography. So I've come increasingly to think of the before and after with this narrow band of something we call cinema in the middle, which I assume is over. I mean, we have moving pictures, but the thing that was called cinema, that very much, I think, belongs to the past. And we can look at it with affection, nostalgia, and so forth. But we look at it through very different techniques and different media than when it was cinema. I used to, I, I call myself a film and media historian, but I think the media part has become more important uh, over the years. Um, and here are some specimens. Can you, should, can we, should we turn the lights down a little bit? There are quite a lot of pictures here. So just to lower the lights very slightly, it might make the pictures a little bit clearer, if that's convenient. Um, these are some specimens. Um, I've discovered in the last few days since being in Brazil, in Oro Preto, I've discovered your very own pre-cinema um, form media, which is the, the oratorio. And if I had time, I would be talking about uh, the great pleasure I've taken in discovering oratorios and all their, their variety and so forth. That's something I think that has a lot of bearing on what we're talking about. You'll find out what the other images are as we go along. I want to start with the issue, which is my jumping off point for this, of um, film history. The problem with film history, I suggest to you, is that generations of pioneer film historians, when they were looking at the early years of their national cinemas, tended to be very focused on the first appearance of indigenous production. There are countless books that begin by saying the first film made in Britain, Brazil, Russia, etc. Firstness, being first, has always been taken in, in cinema history as the starting point. Establishing what that first film is, whether it's lost or whether it's found, is, is usually where traditional histories have begun. And actually the Lumiere, the story of the Lumiere brothers has got a lot to answer for because that is taken as the primordial scene. This is the primal scene of cinema. The Lumiere brothers, you're all familiar with the photographs. The magic moment in 1895, the magic moment in 1896 when they first show films to an audience. They weren't the first moving pictures, that's for sure. They were the first company that spread out across the world and brought moving pictures to many audiences. But the way that they have been plucked out and set up as a kind of starting point, I think has, been, has deformed the history of visual spectacle and even the history of moving pictures. Because there are many other practitioners of moving pictures who were just as important locally as the Lumiere brothers were and who also were more involved in what came before cinema than the Lumiere's. We know nothing about the Lumiere's interests in any of the pre-cinema media, um, and yet undoubtedly they did have interests in, in those media, but that's never talked about. And in fact, most early films, as I'm sure you know, not too much, <laughs> not too much, otherwise I can't. No, not too much. Stop, 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 stop. A little bit more now. Just a little bit. That's better. Yeah. Okay, most, um, most early films, uh, the vast majority of early films, in fact, made by all the different producers in the, the 
the years up to 1900, 1901, 1902, were in fact remakes of acts and performances, songs, skits, stage shows, etc., um, which were being remediated on film. Uh, we could take any number of examples. Um, that's George Bellier's appearing on screen, performing an act very similar to the Stop. <laughs> we had it right a moment ago. Um, Melies is performing one of the stage acts that he did in his own theatre at the Arts of Robert Houdin. And here he is remediating it, performing it on screen. This is a film by Robert Paul, the British pioneer, who again is creating the kind of uh, comedy sketch that would have been seen on stage in an English musical, a joke about accelerated baby growth. So this is a common pattern for early film production. It depends very much on what came before. The method of delivery is new, but the content, the feel, and the identity of the performance is something the audience knows. Now I want to go step back to what was, I think, one of the most important uh, media that came before moving pictures and a very influential medium on moving pictures, and that's the, the panorama. Um, I say panorama with a capital P because the panorama was in fact an invention. We could point back in history to um, early examples of panoramic painting um, and presentation, but the panorama was created by Barker and was the first version was in Edinburgh, the second version was in London, in Leicester Square in the 1790s. And this became a craze. Uh, very quickly across Europe and in other parts of the world, panoramas spread like wildfire. Um, they were undoubtedly the first spectacular form of display of, of the century, of the, the 19th century, because they started just at the threshold of the 19th century. And there are some panoramas that still exist. I don't know of any panoramas in Latin America. Does anybody know of any? I don't think so. Yes. There is? In Rio. In, everything is in Rio. The entrance, yes. the entrance of the bay. Not everything. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, the, the great historian of panoramas, uh, Ralph Hyde, died um, within the last year. And one of Ralph's enthusiasms was to collect examples of panoramas that he didn't already know about. There were very few of those. And he also told me a few years ago, he said, you know, they're still being created. There are panoramas being created in ex, the ex-Soviet Union, in Korea, in China, in all sorts of places. So the panorama, and I'll come back to this theme, is not entirely a dead medium. If you want to see a historic panorama, um, you can go to Rio, or you can go up to Canada, to saint anne de beaupre and you can see a wonderful 19th century panorama in its original building. It's worth a trip. We have these pictures, these are very, very well-known images, I'm sure you've all seen them, which are contemporary images from 1790s and early 1800s, which show us the workings of the panorama. But to really get a better sense of it, we have to go inside. Now, that image, on the, the left is an original watercolour of the entrance to the Leicester Square panorama in London. And that's still there. If you go to Leicester Square, there's a cinema next to it, but you can actually see that door that they're going in. You can see more, but I'll tell you later. This, I think, is very valuable. This illustration on the right is really what it felt like and what it still feels like to be inside a panorama. It's a very... Um, impressive experience, a very unusual experience, because you're actually on a viewing platform and you're looking at what looks for all the world like a tour of the horizon in enormous detail with a trompe l'oeil effect in the foreground which makes you feel it's even more three-dimensional. In fact, it's a flat painting, of course. And this is a little collage I've made to give you a sense of the setting which the panorama and some of its relations appeared. These are two images of Leicester Square in London. Uh, some of you may know it. Um, on the right 
is another structure. The panorama was to the edge of Leicester Square, just off the square. But this stood right in the center of Leicester Square. It's called the Great Globe. And it stood there for the whole middle part of the 19th century. It's a gigantic globe with a network of staircases that you could go all round it and it's the earth turned inside out. So you're looking at the earth as it were from inside it, but you're looking at the surface of the earth. It's an extraordinary structure. There are a number of photographs of it. To look at Leicester Square today, to imagine this enormous globe sitting there um, is, is quite impressive. Again, it's impressive, but it makes you realize that even the panorama was not a unique phenomenon. It, it gave rise to many other forms of spectacular, immersive displays. And that, I think, is the key term. The most immersive of these was the diorama. And the diorama is a kind of offshoot of the panorama. It emerged in the, uh, the 1820s, invented by Daguerre, also credited as the, one of the inventors of photography in France. Um, the difference between panorama, which is a flat painted cylinder, and the, the diorama is that the diorama gives uh, a spectral image. A spectral image in the sense that the lights go down, the audience is outstanding, as they are in this illustration, or sometimes seated and being moved around mechanically. And what they're seeing is a changing image where light levels are being adjusted to give the effect of sunset, sunrise, all sorts of atmospheric effects. So it's a very, um, very subtle effect, full of change, giving a sense that you are there. And that central illustration, by the way, is the diorama in the middle of Oxford Street in London. If you've ever been to Marks and Spencer's in Oxford Street, that's called the Pantheon Building. And that is on the very site where the, one of the many dioramas in London stood. It was a shopping center with a diorama attached. Shopping malls are not new. <laughs> There's another aspect to this which I think is very important, and it's um, Erki Kutomo. Some of you may have come across, who's a, a Finnish early media historian based in Los Angeles. And um, he's really the, the inventor of the term media archaeology, which I'll come back to as well. But he's also the inventor of the term peep media. So his suggestion is that there are panoramic media and peep media. Peep in the sense of things that we look into. And that, I think, is a really useful distinction. Because we live in a world, increasingly, of things that we look into. But it is a long history even a much longer history than the history of the panorama. The peep show, as it's normally called in English, and you'll have to make translations into other languages as we go along, the peep show is a very old device. It goes way back to the 16th, 17th century. There are many illustrations of traveling, um, touring uh, presenters of peep shows. There's one who's a, a one-legged man who tours his box and charges a small amount of money to peer inside, to see what appears to be a world that opens up as you look into the box. Again, peep shows, and many of them do still exist in museums, are very, very impressive. You look at this box, once you put your eye close to it, suddenly the world inside it becomes the total world that you're um, immersed in. There's a more um, uh, elegant, um, 19th century version. And on the right is probably the, the climax of the peak media, the Kaiser Panorama, which is a way of dealing with the problem of the single viewer. If you have a circular structure with seats for lots of people, where the image in front of them changes automatically, you can actually accommodate an audience, a multiple audience. The Kaiser Panorama, again, is very popular in the later part of the of the 19th century. There are many Kaiser Panorama installations. One or two still survive in Europe. Walter Benjamin, in his reminiscences of a childhood in Berlin, has a wonderful section on the Kaiser Panorama, saying that he thinks it's really more attractive than moving pictures. He wrote this in the 1930s. So he was already feeling nostalgic for the media of his youth. But 
On top there, the home stereoscope is, of course, one of the, but perhaps the most popular version of the stereoscope, which was the most popular optical entertainment of the 19th century. Hugely uh, successful. Uh, millions, undoubtedly millions, of stereoscopes of several different patterns were sold in every country in the world. Uh, and I think one of the problems with received history is that people don't really understand just how pervasive the stereoscope was. They were everywhere. And the, uh, the quantity of stereoscopes and stereographs, the cards that you put in them, is always being underestimated. These are not occasional curiosities that you find in a junk shop. There were tens, hundreds of thousands of these produced. Millions, undoubtedly, when you take account of the size of the editions. I tried to deal with some of these media uh, in a TV series that I wrote and co-produced back in the 90s. And um, we were very lucky. It was a moment when BBC television was open to doing um, shows like this. It was a five-part series, which were done on Saturday nights, hard to believe. Saturday evenings, mid-evening. Television's not like that now. Fortunately, you can find most of it on YouTube. So if you're interested in having a look, you can see some quite, I think, quite successful recreations of the effects of some of these media with an audience. So what we tried to do at that point already was to build in the question of the audience, not just to look at the hardware. Now, I'm going to be ranging across the history of media a little bit um, in this presentation, and I just want to jump to a much more recent stage, which I think is very important. Um, Nana Verhoeff, uh, who teaches in Utrecht, has written a series of really interesting articles and books, and there's quite a lot of her work online. Um, she made her name in thinking about mobile screens, the condition of the mobile screen, which we all know and live with. Nana, I think, was the first person to actually really theorize this in an interesting and, and, and very um, insightful way. And for instance, she has several chapters in this book, Mobile Screens, about the, the touch screen, the dirty window effect, where the screen is a thing, not a window, but we simply look forward, then look through. I, I recommend her work very much if we want to understand the later developments of some of the media that I've been presenting in their first versions. So we have a situation at the end of the 19th century where there are comprehensive libraries of stereographs, that's the cards, and lantern slides, which are widely available. There are, again, hundreds, thousands of them. You have a catalogue, you look down the catalogue. If you want one, it doesn't matter where you're living, you simply send your money to the publisher and they will post it to you. And the surprising thing is that certainly stereographs, which were very, uh, they made of cardboard, curved cardboard, um, not fragile at all, easy to post. The spread of postal services in the later 19th century made it very possible to receive them wherever you were living. Surprisingly, glass lantern slides were also postable. I'm not quite sure how, but they were definitely widely available. You could order them from the main, from any of the suppliers. And of course, these don't exist as isolated phenomena. They form series. Uh, typically, they're presented in books. The typical form, I think you, you saw there, that's the library edition of um, the, the way stereographs are marketed and bought and stored. Um, this is what they look like close up. Rome, through the stereoscope, for instance, is a tour of Rome with all the key sites of Rome. And the biggest publisher, Underwood and Underwood, we're very um, bullish about the value of the stereographic tour. They say it quite straightforwardly, it's much better than going and being there. It's cleaner, it's cheaper, you see all the key sites. Um, they made no bones about it. They were absolutely clear that um, you know, this was a viable alternative and maybe even an improvement on the messy, dangerous business of travel. So the tour by stereoscope 
is uh, a well-established cultural form. And what it does, of course, it exists in parallel with the, the Magic Lantern Show, or the Lantern Show. By the end of the 19th century, they weren't called Magic Lanterns, they were called Optical Lanterns. Magic sounded a bit old hat. So that the, the Lantern Show was a, a well-established cultural and social form. There were halls at least as big as this, considerably bigger than this. There were lanterns using high-level illumination, which could fill the screen just as that screen is being filled now. Probably better, actually, using limelight. And there were lecturers, there were star lecturers like Burton Holmes, who invented the term travelogue. So Burton Holmes would tour the world, give lectures, which were well attended, enormously well attended. He made a fortune on his tours, and increasingly he added himself into the tour. So that's a photograph, for instance, of Burton Holmes posing on one of his field trips, so that he will show this image as he's talking to an audience to, as it were, prove that he's been there. It's a question of inserting himself into this, this, this um, tour that he's providing. And, of course, the term travelogue carries straight into moving pictures. So very quickly, the earliest moving pictures of locations of famous sites are linked together, usually by a lecturer, such as Burton Holmes, or less talented, who is actually linking these together in a continuous presentation. The term travel, of course, becomes part and parcel of cinema, but it comes from the Lantern Show. Oh, good. It looks a bit better on your screen than it does on my screen. Um, yeah. Now, I've been talking about the, the international trade in spectacular images in its two main forms, the, um, the lantern uh, slide and the stereograph, stereoscope. And I'm talking about them in relation to the circulation of popular images and popular subjects, such as the ruins of ancient Rome. So of course the earliest subjects that were um, developed for these media were the sites that everyone wanted to see. Rome, Greece, Egypt. Those are the, that's the basic repertoire. Gradually that begins to enlarge, to include the Alps, spectacular scenery, the landscape, not just ancient buildings. But it's very Europe-centered. It's extremely Europe-centered. What about the question, which is really why we're here, what about the question of the, the new world, the old new world, the question of Latin America? Where is that in the repertoire of these media? Well, I think the short answer is at first it's nowhere. And basically, we can see gradually the arrival of the representation of Latin America um, as a developing theme through the 19th century. Well, it starts actually, of course, a bit earlier. And it starts in the form of um, drawings. Drawings which, take the, which can be the basis of a panorama. All the panoramic paintings, the huge panoramic paintings, were based on drawings that someone had done, usually by going to see for themselves and making a very precise drawing, which is then scaled up as a painting. So these are proto-panoramas. They're often called panoramas, of course, because that's what they are. Um, and here, we, Mexico is the first part of Southern America um, that becomes a subject for spectacular representation. As you can see, it appears in the panorama um, in 1823, pretty early. So audiences, spectators in Europe are getting their first image of this distant, mythical place, which is Mexico, from the early 1820s. And this, um, this is the Bay of Rio de Janeiro, now exhibiting in the panorama from drawings taken in the same year, 1823. I saw this actual um, drawing, these two, these two um, uh, illustrations, and the book exactly as you're seeing them in an exhibition in Sao Paulo yesterday. If you're anywhere near Sao Paulo in the coming weeks, I would urge you to go and see the Setubo um, collection display, which is on, on, on show. It's an amazing, array of 
early representations of Brazil. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I've taken some photographs in it, which I'll be including in this presentation. The first um, immersive representations of Central America, because it is Central America that comes first, come from the school of um, panoramic painting in Germany. Uh, Hubert Sattler paints several major canvases of Yucatan. You can see the, this interest in the exotic, the barbaric, and the historic is, of course, what's guiding the choice of subjects. This is Sattler's Temple of Tulum and the Yucatan. It's also worth just noting in passing that this is the era, the second half of the 19th century, was the era when um, landscape painting on an ever increasing scale becomes a feature of many uh, cultures. In America, there are many, many landscape painters who are producing gigantic canvases, finding the sublime, the sublime of landscape and mountains, distant uh, uh, horizons. Um, for instance, in Peru, there's a lot of Peru starts to turn up in landscape painting in the later 19th century. Er Erki Hutomo, I mentioned earlier, the um, me pioneer media archaeologist, has published this really interesting book, uh, Illusions in Motion. He believes that um, the moving panorama um, is, is a, an overlooked and neglected aspect of this whole development. Well, there's panoramas where something moves, usually on rollers. It unrolls in front of you. Vertically, horizontally, something. There are various different mechanisms, and Erki has devoted years to amassing a collection of the relics of the moving panorama. He he's convinced that it was very widespread, but we just don't have any working examples, so we can't actually see them in operation. It's, it's a very rich book, but worth looking at. And what I have extracted from it is one of the very few examples of a panorama, moving panorama of Mexico and California. And you can see there the dates. It's, it's uh, exhibited in uh, 1850. It's shown at Barnum's, P.T. Barnum's Museum in Philadelphia, which unfortunately burns down in the following year. So that's probably the end of that. I don't think it survived. We have the, the poster which um, advertises it. And of course, other new media are beginning to portray Latin America with a new realism photography. Photographers are moving increasingly out into the wilds and are using um, still photography to um, capture the wonders of nature in various parts of Latin America. Just one example of many, of course. This is what brings together some of the items I've been talking about. Um, that's a moving panorama. Top left gives you an idea of the, the kind of mechanism. That's Daguerre's painting before he creates the, the diorama. And you can see in Daguerre's own painting the sort of dioramic impulse already present. And of course, there's a portable form of the diorama. All of these media develop a portable form. So on the one hand, there are gigantic immersive uh, forms, but on the other hand, there are ones that you can fold up in a box. And there is a little portable um, diorama. And below, on the left there, uh, a photograph I took this summer in Stockholm at the Domitor Conference, that where Erki Hutomo, who's back there, and I were taking a group of students to see the biological diorama which still exists in Stockholm. And you can get a sort of sense of what it's like. So we have here, um, where Mexico continues to be an important theme. And there's a steady tradition of the representation of Mexico um, in panoram proto panoramic images like this. Now, I, want to, I need to go back and say more about the tradition of the lantern, um, because that's very important, obviously, as we look at the different media that tend towards to come together at the end of the 19th century. Um, it's quite interesting that the, traditionally, um, 
the patient of the lamps was attributed to uh, Athanasius Kierkegaard, who was a Jesuit, 17th century Jesuit, who wrote a treatise on the, uh, the magic lantern. And it's not unimportant, I suppose, that the Jesuits came to be associated with the use of the lantern as a teaching and as a, an evangelical medium. In fact, he wasn't the inventor. He was actually um, uh, writing about something which already existed, um, which had existed for quite a few years before he um, he uh, started, uh, became aware of them. And Kirsha writes that a rival of his was giving magic, magic lantern shows in Paris, Lyon, Rome, and Copenhagen before 1671 and had, quote, sold such lanterns to different Italian princes in such an amount that they are now almost everyday items in Rome. So Kirsha is complaining in 1671 that there are too many lanterns about. they become commonplace. That, I think, tells us again something about the way the, the lantern took off um, as, a, as a medium, as a device, as a conversation piece also um, in the late um, 17th century. And on the missionary front, because um, the missionary front is quite important, this is, the, this is a, one of the earliest representations I've found of Jesuits using the magic lantern. It's quite late, 1887. It's lecturing at Jesuit Union College, uh, typically using the lantern as a teaching device. Jesuits, of course, were great educators as well as great uh, propagandists. But it's not all the story of the Jesuits. Again, this would be a, a, a mistake to assume that the Jesuits were the only important users of the lantern. Um, I found some thinking about this presentation here. I started looking in missionary researchers. It's a very rich area of people who are researching the archives of various missionary societies, which of course are fantastic raw material for many parts of, of the world. And I found um, some very interesting work by Alejandro Martinez on the South American Missionary Society in Paraguay, operating in Paraguay in the 1890s. Um, Martinez reports that these British missionaries Protestant missionaries found the use of the magic lantern greatly increased their impact on the extant Indians after the, some initial anxiety caused by the projected images. The missionary bulletin reported, and I'll, I'll quote this, um, it's quite interesting, this is a verbatim account um, from the missionary bulletin. It was at this time that Grubb, that's the missionary, took out a lantern and slides. It was a great event and it marked a new stage in teaching. Hitherto, instruction had been given by means of pictures shown to small groups of people. Short, informal religious services had been held in the house or near the village. Now came the novelty of the lantern. The young folks were curious and expectant, while the older people were dubious and fearful. On the first occasion, the sheet was nicely stretched, the lantern in position, and the audience squatting on the ground in front waiting for something to happen. When the first picture appeared on the screen, they were startled and promptly covered their faces to ward off the impending calamity. For as they put it, they were afraid of the little devil that lived in the black box and jumped out onto the white blanket. Now, once over their initial fear, the Yankset became attentive and practiced spectators. Indeed, the need for good pictures for critical indigenous audiences was soon noted. Quote, the Indians are most critical, and really good pictures are a necessity, accustomed as they are to observe minute words and details of their surroundings. They criticize every picture in a way that an English audience would not. Might I advise that each set of pictures be by the same artist? If they see Adam and Eve with fair hair in one picture, and dark in the next, they wonder what caused it. They're not acquainted with hairdressers so basically there's a demand for the pictures to be realistic, believable, and consistent. What's interesting about this account is that it challenges the kind of standard assumptions 
that we might have about native audiences being astonished by superior technology, yes, there might be a moment, a threshold moment of astonishment, but very quickly they become practiced and demanding spectators. And I think that, that tells us a lot about the whole question of early spectatorship. Not very different, in fact, from the audiences for missionary and temperance lantern slides in Europe at the same time. So, a parallel development is happening in Europe and in many other parts of the world. The lantern has been adopted particularly by movements of social reform, people who are ca campaigning for temperance, for less alcohol consumption. And you can see here a transition from the traditional temperance lantern slide set, which is painted and drawn on one side, to the life model version, which becomes the norm at the end of the 19th century. Now, of course, when we look at these life model sets, what we see is effectively a prototype film. And indeed, many early films were quite simply adapted from life model narratives. Uh, in some cases, possibly even the same actors who had posed for the lantern slides, photographic lantern slides, become the first actors in early film. So we have to add these narratives within primarily the lantern repertoire to the other examples I've been giving. And here's a set of statistics, an attempt to assess the output of a company such as Underwood and Underwood, just to give you some idea of the scale of lantern activity by the end of the century. Here's another example. Um, this is Bamforth, one of the biggest British producers of um, stereo cards, lantern slides, and soon of films. So this is a perfect example of media transition happening within the same company, which is using the same resources, the same narratives, the same storylines, the same sales techniques as we move across these media. Now, again, how can we relocate this back to Latin America, specifically to Brazil? Um, the impression I got consulting various historians of early cinema, early media in, in, in Latin America is that this is an underdeveloped field of research. And um, I'm very grateful indeed that I've been uh, directed uh, towards some uh, very useful work, particular thesis, um, which um, deals with focuses on one building in particular. Um, this is, um, sorry, I'm losing my place here. This is um, uh, Alice uh, Truces, Alice du Dubina Truces, research on Porto Alegre, which is an absolutely wonderful read. Well, if you're interested in this period transition, I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, it improved my reading of Portuguese no end. Mm -hmm. Basically, how much Portuguese you can read. <laughs> um, what Alice finds in her study of this single theatre, most of her work is on the Teatro San Pedro in Porto Alegre, is that basically she had expected clearly that it would show that moving pictures arrive in the late 1890s and from that point onwards they become part of the repertoire. Not really the case. First of all, she finds you have to go back to 1861. What she's finding is a mixed variety of presentation using the magic lantern but using it in all sorts of different ways. So there isn't a sharp line at 1896 or 1897. There is in fact a continuous development of types of presentation in a variety of format, which crosses that line, starts to incorporate moving pictures, but does not become a complete moving picture show until well into the next century. This is the same pattern that we find almost everywhere. Here are some examples that she that are quoted in her thesis, which is also a book now, by the way. Um, you can see the kind of presentation at the Teatro San Pedro. Yeah. But if we turn around and look at much more commonly studied locations, and this is probably the, one of the most studied locations in the entire world, this is the Empire in Leicester Square. This is where the Lumiere brothers had their biggest success in early 1896 when they took 
the cinematograph from Paris, where it was shown in a very small hall, to the biggest music hall in London. And they began a series of shows which continued for years. And you can see they took a publicity photograph with their name up on the front of the Empire, advertising Lumiere. In fact, that Lumiere show was only 10 minutes uh, within the overall program. And you can see in that poster uh, from another theatre that the Lumiere cinematograph, like all moving picture presentations, is only a part of the overall program. There's quite a long period of at least 10 years before moving pictures become anything more than one item amongst many. Now, I want to just introduce, reintroduce, what I think is a very, very important concept and dynamic that helps us make sense of these processes I've been laying out in front of you. And that's the concept of remediation. Uh, formally speaking, it was introduced in, in um, Jay Bolton, Richard Grusin's book, um, Understanding New Media, or subtitle Understanding New Media. I think it's a terrific book. I find it's, uh, I press it on all my students and uh, when we did a, a conference in Exeter some years ago, we invited Richard Grusin to, to come and talk about the context in which he and, and uh, Jay Bolter developed this concept. It's a, it's a very simple idea, the representation of one medium in another, which they use to explain the processes of early digital media. They take the very simple example of the desktop. What is the desktop that we know from the computer screen, but a remediation of the conventional desktop. But I think we can do much more with it than that. And there's quite a literature about the notion of uh, remediation. Henry Jenkins, of course, has written a lot about this um, in various works. Again, simple concrete examples. Um, remediation is the driving dynamic across the 19th century, across the period that I've been talking about. I've shown you the hardware. This is the software, the content. So if we take one example, one of the most popular subjects of the 19th and 20th century, the last days of Pompeii, where does it begin? Well, Pompeii was always there. People used to visit Pompeii on the Grand Tour. They could see it. There was no real secret about it. But it was one painting, Briolov's painting, the last days of Pompeii, which he finished about 1830, that really ignited the interest in Pompeii because he dramatized the concept of the engulfing of Pompeii. Bulwer Lytton, a young Englishman, saw the painting, seized by it, wrote a novel called The Last Days of Pompeii. This became a huge bestseller, translated into many languages. It was presented on stage. It was filmed, its first film by Robert Paul in 1898, single shot. It's refilmed again several years later, and again, and again, and again. You can draw a line through cinema from 1898 to the 1930s, and you can take six or eight different versions of The Last Days of Pompeii, and I can give you a perfect example of remediation of the subject, demonstrating the new technical prowess of cinema as it moves along. But it also goes into many other media. It's a pyrodrama. <coughs> it's performed in the open air with fireworks at the center of it. At the end, that's the Pompeii bit, the, the eruption. It was one of the most popular shows. It was done all over America. It was done in Alexandra Palace in North London, many, many other places. If you want to know more about it, look at Maria White's wonderful book, Picture in the Past. She's a Latin scholar, and she's traced the theme of the last days of Pompeii through all its iterations. And there are many. Now, if we look at the early stages of production in Brazil, and again, I've been dipping into the work of a number of, of uh, researchers who, who, of course, I'm not pretending to be an expert in this in, 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 any, in any way. I'm drawing on the research of others, who have been some, some of whom have been kind enough to send it to me. If we look at, for instance, this very well known to early Brazilian cinema historians, um, The Stranglers, 1908. And uh, Riela Nowitzki's work sets this in a very interesting context and shows, for instance, how this kind of sensational filmmaking is deeply embedded in a pattern of popular journalism. 
and a strong sense of local history, the local spectacular. The first audiences of films like this are being encouraged to understand that these were crimes that happened in places they know. And these places will be mediated on the screen. They'll visit those places through the agency of film. Fascinating about the um, early culture of, of Rio and the way that these media all work together. And that, that headline sums it up beautifully, sensationalizing the everyday. She talks about a police reportage, the Thetan, um, narratives in papers, the chronica, all feed into the earliest productions uh, of Brazilian film, uh, filmmakers in, in around 1908, 1909, 1910. There's another motif that comes back. I said earlier that the, one of the themes that runs through stereoscopy and the panorama is the idea of virtual tourism. Of course, it's not called that, but that's what it is. You, you tour the world by visiting a panorama or by buying a box of stereographs. This finds its way into the early exhibition of film. And there are many examples, again, from many different countries of cinema being seen, moving pictures being seen as a form of virtual tourism. Here's an example, for instance, um, which has been done. This is the, the source that I draw these illustrations from, the, the Avenida Central, uh, which allows you to, to visit a city in a train or a car. And of course, you probably know Hale's Tours, which is the best known example of this, which fanned out across the world. At one point, there were three or four Hale's Tours in London alone where you sat in a seat and you saw a film projected in front of you which purported to be the view from a train traveling along railway lines. That was surprisingly popular for at least five or six years. Very profitable. More about remediation and remediation across into the early years of the film. Take the most, one of the best known examples um, of one of the greatest hits of early cinema, the uh, mystery stories, Fantomas. It's a familiar pattern, because Fantomas begins as a series of popular, sensational popular novels. It's part of the literature of sensationalism, which is, again, common to, to many cultures in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. This is the way Fantomas appears in paperback, dime novel, as it were. This is the way Fantomas appears on screen, when Gaumont starts to film Fontenas around 1910-1911. The Fontenas films, when you get to see them, I don't know how many people have seen them, are really quite surprising because they're extremely undramatic. Uh, they're filmed in the most mundane settings, ordinary streets, ordinary houses. Just at the end of each episode, something sensational happens. It's very, very short. You miss it. In fact, it is missing some of the episodes because they've been cut short. So there's a very careful interplay between the mundane, the ordinary, and the sudden flash of something sensational. But look what happens. And you see, and this is the American ad for Fontenas, um, which said, made by Gilmont in the actual uh, places where the stories are set. Authenticity, the sense of the, the real Paris streets, where Fontenas is set, it becomes a selling point, especially when the films are exported to other territories. And I just want to stress the, the mundane aspect, the sense of you are here, you are in an ordinary place, not unlike the pavement that you stepped off before you went into the film show. For instance, the, the um, uh, Nordisk company, which was the most successful film company in the world in 1910, 11, 12, up until the First World War, Nordisk filmed almost all its mystery stories in the suburbs of Copenhagen. Very flat, very ordinary, a real sense of the mundane. It's a typical sort of image from a Nordisk production, which is an appropriate setting for sensational, blood curdling, thrilling events. Now, I just want to move towards a conclusion by saying something about the what I would call the the resistance to the kind of media transitions that I've been talking about, which are, I think, the primary form of intermediality. 
the way that one medium picks up as it were, the baton from an earlier medium and demonstrates its adaptability, its success by remediating what has been the successful content of an earlier medium. Um, around about between 2005 and 2008 or 9, there's a real current within film theory of resistance to the digital, which I find fascinating. I'm just picking out one example here, David Rodewick's book, The Virtual Life of Film. Uh, David, bless his cotton socks, went to enormous lengths to argue that a film like Russian Ark is not a film, it's a digital event. It was very, very important to, to argue that a film is a film is a film. <laughs> Uh, the implication being that a film has to be a piece of acetate passing through a projector. You can quite say that, but the, the filming experience is something uh, irreducible and something intrinsic and essential. Yes, Russian art is very impressive, etc. It's a version of the one-shot film, but it's not a film. I think in retrospect, I'm sure David doesn't hold this view any longer. <laughs> I think he went to some extremes to argue it, he has a very important point, of course, that certainly, yes, some aspects of the experience are different, but this idea that it's either not a film or a film is perhaps the wrong battle to fight. As we move more fully into the digital era um, now, I think we see, of course, very clearly that digital media have their qualities, their variations, their quiddity, their specificity. We already are connoisseurs of the digital. We know the difference between different kinds of screens, different kinds of digital apparatus. It's not just one thing, the digital. It's all the different gadgets we use. Look at this wonderful piece of remediation, uh, this interface which allows you to dial old style on your phone. <laughs> we have many examples of this. You all know that all, all your phones will take photographs that are in Victorian sepia. You, you too can be a Victorian photographer, very simple. So the, the pleasure that we now take in luxuriating in the options that the digital gives us is of course something which could not have been guessed at at the beginning of the last decade. And again, I turn to someone like uh, Nana Rebeuf's work on the early iPhone is absolutely wonderful in terms of putting a finger on these experiences. Underpinning a lot of this work, I think, is the revival of interest in Michel de Certo. Michel de Certo's work on practice of everyday life, his notion of practices that describe and govern our life is something which the ethnographers and anthropologists of new media are using more and more. And again, I think de Certo is an absolutely essential starting point for understanding how these things become part of our lives. Of course, de Certo died long before uh, any of these media became a reality, just as McLuhan died before computers became much of a reality, but still they can be very important guides for us. So if you were going to ask me, just in case you were, um, who I would think are the most useful guides into the world of digital media, the process of mediation, remediation, I would just pick three, because there could be others. I would pick Roger Odin, um, who I think is an absolutely wonderful um, scholar who has moved from being a contemporary of Christian Metz, very much part of the Metzian school of semiotics, towards becoming a very interesting theorist of new media. And uh, there's a chapter by him in my book on audiences about the mobile phone as the ultimate revolution in film, which I strongly recommend to you, and you can download it for free. Um, Nana Lerhoff, I mentioned already, I think is, is terrific in thinking about mobility and the, the fact that we take screens with us, and screens are all around us. And a rather much lesser than an English uh, media theorist, media anthropologist, uh, Sean Moores, who's written a whole series of books which track the different changing status of the... Sorry, I didn't mean to do that.
Good. <laughs> Let me just give you a little bit of text by way of mere conclusion. I think we're okay for time. Should we start it uh, a little bit later? Um, this is a slide I made for my students, my master's students um, in London, just recently, just as kind of summary to fulfill exactly this function. And what I was doing was trying to make a distinction between personal media that we carry around with us, the smartphone, the tablet, the laptop, and environmental or ambient media in the street and in the city. So that's one big distinction. And then I trace in these texts a, a sort of arc that goes from Raymond Williams, one of the early theorists of television um, in the 1970s. His book on television as a cultural form is still in print, you probably know it. I go through a cultural geographer, Doreen Massey, who unfortunately died just earlier this year, and her wonderful writing about globality and place, her famous essay, Global Sense of Place. And then I just end on something there from Sean Moore's Media, Place and Mobility, where he talks, and that's just a breakdown of his last book, Situational Geography of Social Life, when space feels familiar, forms of dwelling in a world of flux. He's drawing on Heidegger, very unexpected for an English theorist to draw on Heidegger for that sense of dwelling. Um, and his conclusion is very interesting, and I think it's really important. He argues, as a number of theorists do today, for a non-media-centric media studies. In other words, media studies has been bedeviled by being much too preoccupied with media. It's crazy. Media are not important to most people. They're merely the means by which various experiences uh, are had, various practices take place. It's the practices, the experiences that are important, not the media. Media historians need to get real, and demote their preoccupation with media, and re replace media in a more uh, sensible relationship to the spectrum of people's lives. So here is ambient media. We're back in Leicester Square. Just behind the View Cinema there is that entrance, sorry, just to the left of the View Cinema is that entrance to the panorama, which you can still find. And there is where the, 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 the panoply of Leicester Square with all its gewgaws and attempts to draw us in, uh, gull, hapless tourists. Most media history happened within a few hundred yards of that very spot that you see on screen. The panorama happened there, the Ida Fusicon, the very first one music moving pictures happened just up the road in Lyle Street. Many other early film distribution happened just across the road. The first street of film distributors in the world, in London and Cecil Court. Many things can be traced back to this, this one area of central London. And this is a summary from Nana Verhoef from one of her presentations, Urban Screens, The City as an Interface. We don't just carry screens around with us, although we all do that. We encounter and interact with screens in our cities. Screens that form the architecture of and punctuate our urban trajectories. And this is where De Certo meets Verhoef, as it were. You have heard, of course, of, I'm sure you've heard of the phrase dead media. There's a very entertaining website dead media. Its motto is, no medium is ever dead. <laughs> All media survive in some form or other. This is again a very important axiom. Literally, no medium is dead. Somewhere there are people who care for it, cherish it, collect it increasingly, and keep it alive. So we live in a strange uh, ecosphere of ever proliferating media in which none ever disappear, but new ones get added. This is a very strange situation. And I think the project of the Dead Media project is a very interesting one because it's to retrieve these spurned, forgotten, neglected media, to give them status again. But as, as Erki Hutomo would say, no medium deserves to be treated as a lesser medium, an unimportant medium. They're all equally important, some bigger than others, but we should not adopt that scale of values, which was a part of early media studies, of talking about dominant media, big media, important media. All media have 
have their own significance. Now, I'm just going to end on a, a, a series of slides which I just put at the end of this talk to really offer them to you as subjects for further research because, as I say, I'm a mere novice, literally a novice in Brazil and Latin America, unlike the majority of you. So what can I offer you apart from some of the connections I've tried to make? Well, I can offer you some samples and say, what do you make of these? What would you do with these? What kind of frameworks of interpretation and analysis can you fit them into? These are the primary evidence that you could be working with and should be working with, I think. Here, for instance, is this spectacular display, the Modern Mexico Exhibition, which was held at the, the Egyptian Hall. The Egyptian Hall was the birthplace of many media. It's where Méliès first saw magic shows when he was in London. It's where um, a whole succession of devices were displayed through the 19th century and into the early 20th century. But it was before that, it was an exhibition space. And modern Mexico was probably the first time that Mexico reached London in a vivid uh, form. There are hundreds and thousands of stereotypes, stereographs in collections all over the world. You have them here in many museums, I know, in Brazil. The New York Public Library has a fabulous collection, almost all of which are online. You can actually sit at your computer and look at almost the entire inventory of the New York Public Library, and you can see them in stereo. They've developed a gadget which allows you to view them in stereo. So you've got no excuse. You could be looking at the repertoire of the subjects that were chosen to represent different aspects of Latin America. Here are just some examples I've picked out. Of course, products. Rubber is very important. Colonial interiors are very important. There isn't time to decode, to decode that, but it's a rather interesting text uh, about Santa Cruz. Lantern slides. Missionary lantern slides. What can we learn from the very, very large collections of missionary lantern slides which have been preserved, usually by the missionary societies, which are available and have not been adequately studied? They should be studied by people who are not historians of missionary activity, but by media historians trying to make some sense of what use was made of them. And here are some examples from the exhibition that I mentioned in, that's currently on in, in uh, Sao Paulo. This, uh, one of the themes that runs through this exhibition, which I found fascinating as an outsider, is the secrecy that surrounded Brazil. I mean, this is something that you, I'm sure, all know about, but I did not realize that Portugal, in particular, um, enforced a total cordon sanitaire around Brazil and would not allow anyone to visit Brazil or to picture it. No printing was allowed in Brazil until a very late day. So Brazil was kept literally as a secret, unknown place. And so what's interesting about the examples here is that many of them were actually underground, surreptitious attempts to picture Brazil at a time when it was forbidden. That's the theme which nobody else has in the world, the forbidden image of the country. In the exhibition, there is a wonderful um, video digital recreation of the panorama using the surviving image of the panorama. They've created the experience of a 360 degree pan around in the exhibition. It's terrific. It's, uh, it's well worth seeing. This is again from that theme that I was talking about the uh, complete vista of the capital of Brazil, which is Rio, of course, of secret Brazil. Uh, from the um, 18th century. And a very interesting point that also emerges from the exhibition, which again is really food for thought, and I was talking about this, uh, about this earlier to, to, to um, uh, is, is that um, when the artists and publishers of Rio realized what interest there was in the visual representation of Rio, they became publishers themselves. And they realized that there was a a real trade to be done in producing visualizations of Rio as mementos for the many visitors who pass through Rio on their way to somewhere else. So Rio becomes a really important center of publication. 
um, of the spectacular topographical um, within Brazil, probably uniquely well placed because of its, its uh, location. Um, that's all I've got to say. I'm, I'm just putting these up in case anybody wants to look at some of the work I've been doing which is relevant to uh, what we've been talking about. These are two reports I did about um, <coughs> cultural impact and audience hood, which are both on the BFI website. Um, stories we tell ourselves and opening our eyes, which I think is, is quite useful methodologically if you're interested in working on audiences and the place of film in people's lives. This is my book, Audiences, uh, which includes Roger Odena's chapter and much else besides, which you can download for free from the Amsterdam University Press website. How wonderful is that? <laughs> they tell me that it's now had 4,500 downloads. Now, if any of you have an academic book out, you know the miserable numbers that you can normally achieve. 500? 700? You're doing really well? 4,500! <laughs> the fact that it's free, of course, helps. The fact that you just go to the um, URL and it downloads onto your computer. I think that we are seeing the future of academic publication, quite honestly. And I'm very excited to be a part of that. Amsterdam University Press have a policy of putting everything online for free, which they say does not harm library sales at all. In fact, it increases them. So I think I'll leave you with this thought. I'm working a lot on my at the moment, as, as Luciana said. Uh, she implied I'm working on an exhibition for next year, a big book of Eisenstein's drawings. And my, my um, co uh, author, Alan Clayman, just wrote this, I was just correcting the proofs the other day. He said, um, he quoted Eisenstein, genetic code of cinema. How the general laws of perception of the world in terms of images came through it. Eisenstein was against the idea of cinema as a specific form. He saw cinema as simply one stage in the great procession of media, which he got went back to ancient times, prehistoric times, and would continue. And one of the last essays he wrote, which has only recently been translated in full into English, is about the future of cinema is stereoscopic. He wrote this in 1948. He believed that cinema had to march on and move into the next era. He was a little bit ahead of himself, but then Eisenstein was always ahead of himself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.